welcome. God bless you. This is the 12th and final message in the life and faith of Abraham. I want to thank you for subscribing and listening. Uh, I've just been grateful for this opportunity just to do these things. Well, the title of this message is The Final Test. It's not the biggest test, but it's his final. His biggest test has been running about 40 years long. It began when it began back in Ur, the Chaldees, uh, when God asked him to leave and go to a place that he would show him. And we use so much of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing where he went. By faith he sojourned. And we've been talking about his journey, his journey of faith. I want to begin this message. The text is going to be in Hebrews 11 again. We've been in Genesis quite a bit, but we're going to, and we will be there later on. But in Hebrews 11, picking up the narrative in verse 17, it says this. I just, I just want to read it. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, this is what God had said to him, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. All this covenant stuff that's been going on between God and Abraham, Isaac's the one, he says. Verse 19, it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure. Remember, we had a message when we talked about, he looked for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The eyes of faith can see things that the natural eye is blind to. We, let me just review that. It says in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return there, but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. See, the eyes of faith allowed Abraham to believe God, which produced an obedience in him to leave and look for a city, knowing that he is going to die, not having received the promises. It's shifted from a temporal city to an eternal one, and he could live a life of faith. Well, this is in the same caliber here, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which also he received him in a figure. Beyond any doubt, Abraham knew that Isaac, this promised son, that waited 25 years to finally conceived, and here he's born, and now he's a young lad, probably between the ages of 12 to 15 years old. So he's been about 40 years in this journey of faith that he's been in. It says in verse 19, and this is so important, he says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, he's going to go and offer him a sacrifice because he accounted, accounting that God was able to raise him up. That word really struck me. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, it says this, God making reference to Abraham, he says this, What saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So it's what God did was, he put it on Abraham's account of faith. He, he said, I'm, your faith, I'm going to add that. I'm going to give you credit to that on your account of faith. Is what Abraham is saying here in verse 19. He's putting on God's account his faithfulness. You're asking me to do something that does not seem to fit with the plan. But I'm going to do it because I am going to put to your account your faithfulness of the promises you had made. That is, that is big stuff. Literally, it moves him into the concept of the resurrection, believing that he was even able to raise him up from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure. In other words, it was like the heavenly city. The eyes of faith could see this. He's so confident that Isaac is the one through whom all the promises must come. He said, God's able to raise him up. Resurrection. That's a big deal. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 8, Paul is standing before Agrippa and giving his defense. And he says this to Agrippa. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? In other words, you've got a big God. Abraham had been told by the angel of the Lord, 
Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Not when you consider that when he spoke, the world came into being. Creation is in his resume. Is there anything? So this resurrection, so he looks at this with the eyes of faith and saying, God, I'm going to obey you because I know you're able because I know Isaac is the promised one, the promised child. And so with that backdrop, I want us to go now to the book of Genesis. And we'll pick up this narrative again here. In Genesis 22, and I want to read this for us. I love reading the scriptures, and I think sometimes it's just good to hear the scriptures in a message. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham. That's where we get our title for the message. Hmm. Final test. Let me stop there just for a moment to say this. When, when I was in college, I had a professor in this one class. I think we had three times a week we had the class, you know. And this professor was known for always having a good quiz every time. He's going to give you a pop quiz. And, you know, what they were were little uh, tests that he would give. And everyone said, if you take the quizzes, you're there and you take these quizzes on a regular basis, You'll do okay in the final because what's on the final is what he's quizzing you about. It's the same thing with Abraham. Abraham is running the hurdles of his faith for 40 years. That's why we call that the biggest test. What he's going to do here in this final is going to vault into where God will look at him and say, Now I know. You're going to believe me. And he says, That's what I'm looking for. You'll believe me when it doesn't seem to make sense. So here we go. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said, this is very significant, this is how God spoke to prophets in the Old Testament. He spoke to them like you're, I'm speaking to this camera. He would speak to people. In Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7, when Abimelech is defending himself after this nightmare God gives him about the fact that this is Abraham's wife, and he said, restore his wife uh, Genesis 20 and verse 7, he said, Restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. Hebrews 1 said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, and in times past, spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. So this voice that has been telling him, Leave her the Chaldees and go to the place that I'll show you, and inherit, he says, Pick up the journey again. See, that's, that's the journey. But it's preparing him for this final test. Is God's word, what's it being tested is, can I believe God? This voice that speaks to me. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, it says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I think every day of our life, we have something that quizzes or tests our faith. To build our faith, to refine our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. To have a faith that's being refined by the, the day in and day out, is God's word true? What he's saying to me, is it true? Can I believe it? If I believe it, will I obey it? These kinds of things are going on in Abraham's life like they're going on in ours today. Well, let me pick up this narrative and read this. And God said unto Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2, And he said, this is God speaking to him, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon all one of the mountains that which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his mule and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Then on the third day he lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the mule and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went, both of them, together. You mean, remember this, they're dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. promise. Something is about to happen from Abraham's faith that's going to transfer to a son's faith. 
You can only live so long off your parents' faith or off someone else's faith. And finally, it has to become yours. And God's, this is a powerful event in the life of faith. The faith of Abraham, the faith of Isaac, and later on, even the faith of Jacob. And Isaac spoke unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? They were accustomed to offering sacrifice, and Isaac knew there needed to be something to offer. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place where God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar of the wood. He would have never been able to do that had Isaac panicked and said, This is insane. I am out of here. I dare say as they both of them went on together, Abraham was reviewing to Isaac his journey of faith from Ur. He said, Count the stars. He said, I can't. He said, You're going to have seed like that. A nation's going to come out of you. Count the sand. He said, I can't. You're going to have a nation come out of you like that. Whew. Okay, Lord, we're waiting for this promised seed. Then to Bethel, same thing. Hebron, the same thing. Egypt, the same thing. Comes back. The journey. He sees the things that are going on in his life. The Hagar, Ishmael, cast out the bondwoman and his son. That's your work. The one I'm planning, I will prove myself to you. is through Sarah. He sees Sodom destroyed. See, in his journey, even up to the last year before Isaac was born, the Gera deal, when he went down to Gera, and he repeated a mistake that he thought, how could I have done this? But God was faithful and restored him back, got him on track. These are the, the test of our day in and day out living. Oh, there's so much of his whole life that are not recorded in these years, but they prepared him for this moment, and he passes the test. He settled it. He knew that God's word was enough. Let me read on. I want to read all the way through 14. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, here's God's voice again, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him upon the burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, meaning my provider. And it is said unto this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. You see, Abraham had got to the place in his journey of faith. He could obey God. That voice that said unto him, that spoke unto him, he knew that God, it, it would be inconsistent with the character and the nature of God, that he knew who God was. Let me give you this, this verse. Hebrews 6, 18, 18 says this, that by two immutable things, and things that never will change about God, who he is and what he's like will never change. He got to know who he is and what he's like, and his promise that Isaac was the seed Everything is wrapped up in that boy, and he knew it. He was convinced that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope which is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of our soul. What about our final? It says that God, who at sundry times in a diverse manner spoke unto the fathers through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. What credentials? The scriptures. Are the scriptures something that we can believe? After the resurrection of Jesus, resurrection day, he's on his he sees two walking on the road to Emmaus, good Orthodox Jews that were believers in Jesus, and they were so downhearted. He shows up to them. He says this unto them in Luke 24, beginning with verse 25. Then said unto him, 
unto them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things <clears throat> and, enter, and to enter into his rest? And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. From Genesis, the promised seed, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, to Jesus. The prophecies. Is his word true? Does God really speak to us today through the scriptures? Is Jesus really the one? That's the question. Is he really the one? In Matthew eleven three, 3, John the baptizer was in prison. And he sent some of his disciples to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you the one? Or look we for another? And Jesus said, spend the afternoon with me. And then go back and tell him what you see. That the gospel is preached to the poor, that the dead are raised, that people are healed. Just go back and tell him who it is. It'll settle him. He is the one. In closing are the scriptures that means the written word of God. Our Bibles, is it really God's word? Is he really speaking to us today? Is his word true? If not, what is our source of truth? Am I left to my own mind? Science? Begin to ask yourself the question, what is my source of truth? There has to be something true. What are the proofs? Can we trust God's Word. Will it endure? Is it relevant? Is it transcendent from 2,000 years ago, the pen stopped, to today? Is it really transcendent? How important is it in my daily life? Is there any power in it? Oh, ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. I can tell you this, this book begins with God's he had the first word, in the beginning, God. Can I tell you something? In the end of Revelation, he has the last word. Yes, there's great power in the word of God. That's what we're going to be looking at when we come back after a short break for a few weeks. We'll be taking a look at the importance of the scriptures or the importance of the word of God. Until then, may the God of all grace, who has called you unto his eternal glory, after you've suffered a while, Make you perfect, strengthen, establish, and settle you. God bless you.